Good morning, everyone. Abu Ahmed is always very nice and very generous, and uh, I'm not that well known. Uh, so don't believe everything you hear. Uh, delighted to have you in this uh, really wonderful event that we have every year. It's called the Economic Research Forum Annual Conference. And since you have just heard it's the 22nd, that means we have been around for quite some time. We are not young anymore. Uh, what, uh, what I want to do in these brief remarks at the beginning is to say something about why the theme of the conference is an important one. I also want to say something about what else other than the main theme of the conference, because the conference is not only about the main theme, there are lots of other things taking place. And since, it's got, since this is really the last time for me to stand here as the managing director of ERF, I want to reflect a little bit about that institution, which I think is a very unique uh, experiment in our region. So let me start off with the theme of the conference, the main theme of the conference. Uh, the main theme of the conference is towards a new development agenda for uh, the ERF region. Why did we pick that theme? Those of you who are familiar with what ERF has been doing over the years, we always picked up one idea and development, so social justice and development, political economy and development, uh, inequality and development, and so on. This time we decided to go for a, a title that says essentially is a future development agenda of the region. And this is not accidental. This is because generally uh, there has been a development agenda that apparently didn't work out very well because people were unhappy and went to the streets in 2010 and 2011. So what is the alternative? If we were unhappy with an economic reform agenda or a development agenda that focuses on growth and private sector initiative and people complained who got the benefits from economic growth anyway. So issues of distribution were not there, not as much as people would have liked, judging by the fact that they went to the streets. If they were happy, they would have stayed home. So something was actually wrong. Uh, and do we have any clues about what they actually wanted? Well, everybody will tell you that the rebellious or the people who went to the street knew what they didn't want, but they had no idea about what they wanted. Certainly, they had the slogans of uh, justice, uh, dignity, and uh, freedom, but translate that to me. Tell me, how does that work out in reality as a development agenda? How do I translate these major, fantastic slogans into actions on the ground? I think that is what is missing. If there is one frequently asked question in Egypt, it is, where are we going? And the other word is, Roya. so where is the vision? What are you trying to do? Where are you trying to get at? Oh, I, trying to be one among the 30, uh, 30 happiest people in the world is a lovely idea, but I'm not really sure what makes you happy, what makes you tick, right? And moreover, even if I knew, what are you going to write to get there? You want to go to Aswan? Are you going to take a plane, a train, a camel, a donkey, or what? So there is this vacuum, if you like. There is something that we didn't like, or a lot of people didn't like, apparently. There is an attempt, there are titles to what we want, but under that, there is very little else. And that was more than good enough as a motivation for us to decide to pick the main theme for this conference to be the future agenda or development agenda for the region. So how are we going to go about it in three plenary sessions, today, tomorrow, and the day after, in the morning? First plenary, which is this one, we are going to deal with issues of navigating the transition. That is, thinking about the turmoil the region is going through, Obviously, with, with the political uh, change, uh, lots of economic consequences have taken place. Investors went away, tourists didn't come, um, popular demands, I want my goodies and I want them now, not tomorrow. Uh, I mean, there was something happening in the economy that requires short-run reaction. Right? And the question, how do you navigate the transition at a time when you don't have the resources? You have popular demands on the one hand, you have constraints on the resources on the other, and how do you match the two? 
That is what this plenary is supposed to deal with. Now, there is always a day after. Today is what these are the transition issues that we have to deal with. But what are you going to do tomorrow? How are we going to make sure that we have a sustainable economic growth that's shared by a lot of people, not just going to the few? This is a structural reform agenda. This is the topic of the plenary of tomorrow morning. We're trying to make the, the plenaries link together so that we keep you coming. So don't come the first day and then say, think you got, you got it, and that's the end of the story. You actually wouldn't know the story until the very end. So just like Agatha Christie, you don't know who killed whom until the very last uh, page of the, of the novel. Now, the third plenary on the third day, we thought that the region is kind of, there are the transition countries and the conflict countries. So we couldn't really close the circle without devoting one session to uh, countries in conflicts or civil wars or what have you. You know, the Libya, the Iraq, the uh, Syria, the Yemen uh, of the region. So the third plenary is going to be about the conflicts and about the root causes of the conflicts, uh, what are the likely political settlements of these conflicts. Uh, we are economists fundamentally, so we need to ask questions about what do you do on the development agenda in the transition during the conflict, for one, but equally importantly, post the conflict. I remember a little story uh, told by Paul Courier about the, what would be a good development agenda um, um, post-conflict. Uh, and he said, typically, you know, you have the World Bank and IMF. And the question is, whom do you call first in, let's say, in Syria? Do you call the IMF to get the house in order first and then get the economy on track structurally and poverty and this and that with the World Bank? He said, typically, people get, go to the blue suit guys, which are the IMF guys, and they don't go to the blue color or the blue collar guys, which is the World Bank. And he uh, was arguing that it is better, in fact, to go to the blue collar guys. It is better to go to the World Bank because what people want in a post-conflict is really questions of poverty and basic needs. They want water, they want sanitation, they want uh, electricity, they want their education system to work and kids to go to school and so on. There are interesting questions that come up in the context of countries post-conflict that I would he, at least he would argue that the World Bank is better qualified to. That's if you want to call any of them, but if you don't, do it on your own. And sometimes that may be a better option. Sorry, this, this actually was in favor of, uh, of Shanta, my friend here. <laughs> All right, so, so these are actually the three plenaries. This is the first part that I wanted to talk about. This is why the theme of the conference and what is it that we are doing in the three plenaries of the conference. Let me move on to the second uh, part of what I want to say which has to do with the conference is, in fact, about more than the, plenary, the, the, the main theme of the conference. Let me highlight a few things for you uh, so that in planning which one to go to and so on, you have a roadmap sort of thing. I hope all of you have uh, the agenda. But there are, there are certain things that I want to point out. We have two, what I call two special plenary sessions, one on labor issues and one on natural resources. The one on labor, ERF does a lot of work on a lot of areas in economics. But we picked up a few themes and made them our business. And we use the annual conference at least to share with you some of the insights that we have accumulated over the years on a certain issue. And this year, we picked these two issues, labor and natural resources. Let me elaborate just a tiny bit. On labor, uh, I think it's one of the areas where ERF has done most work. It has started a long time ago, and it continues even today. And when we talk about labor, we are talking about employment and unemployment, and how do you think about these? We are thinking about the drivers of creating jobs. We are thinking about the nature and functioning or lack of functioning of labor markets. We are, work we are thinking about labor market dynamics. We are thinking about when you graduate from college, where do you go? Do you have a first time job seekers or the link between that and marriage? I mean, there are so many angles of thinking about labor issues that is not as simple as it looks like. I mean, the easiest way of solving an, an, an unemployment problem is hire people in government. 
But of course, that's incredibly costly. So short of that, how else would you go about it? That is, these are real questions. And then you get all sorts of enclaves, like for in, or specific issues, like youth unemployment in particular. It's more problematic than the average. Uh, like female uh, participation in the labor market. And that's also incredibly low in this region, perhaps lower than anywhere else in the world. So there are so many angles. I mean, then the question of labor and business and the relationship between them and labor regulations. So there are, uh, and of course, you want to ensure a balance. As a government, you want to ensure a balance between the, the, the business sector and the labor as a, as a group. So there are so many issues and so many questions, and many of them, either people have the wrong answers, or they don't have any answers altogether, or they think they have the answers. And it's not that apparent. Our group of people uh, who are doing, uh, working on labor are going to be sharing with you some of the insights of what we have done in the labor area. Now, the second special session has to do with natural resources. If you think about our region, there are two groups of countries, that's one way of thinking about it. The groups that are endowed with natural resources, lots of oil and natural gas, and the groups that, do, that does not. Uh, there are further refinements, but I think if we want to talk about the development agenda for the region, we cannot think outside of the, the countries with specific feature, which uh, the countries that have to do with, uh, the countries that have plenty of uh, natural resources. And natural resources come also with the baggage. I mean, people talk about uh, whether a natural resource is a blessing or, or a curse. Uh, Dutch disease, uh, how do you avoid the curse? How do you capitalize on natural resources? How do you make sure you are striking a balance between consumption today and saving tomorrow? How do you macro-manage when oil prices fluctuate as such? Does actually natural resources, do countries with natural resources uh, perform better on average in terms of growth or job creation or this or that. What do actually countries with natural resources do with the natural resources they have? They, what do they do with their rent, really? Uh, sovereign wealth funds, I mean, the number of issues that surround the whole area of natural resource countries and natural resource countries management are really many and very sophisticated and very complicated and the nature of governance in these countries. In fact, most people would argue that, that natural resources are a blessing provided you have good governance. Norway and Nigeria are two very good examples. So our group will share with you in one plenary session what they have been doing on natural resources over the last five years at least or so. So other than the main theme of the plenary sessions, we have two special sessions that I invite you all to, uh, to attend. And then we have uh, six parallel sessions at all other times. And these are the sessions where people get divided uh, in smaller groups. This is really more the academic component of what we do in the annual conference. And this is where uh, we have something on macroeconomics, on microeconomics, on labor, on institutional, on international economics, on finance. And Typically, every year, we get something like 300 proposals for people wanting to write papers and present them at ERF. We end up selecting something like 50 papers, and indeed, this year is no exception. We're going to have 50 papers by uh, a lot of people, uh, more than 50 because most papers are co-authored. So you get a lot of people presenting a lot of papers, and you get people who are discussing the papers, because this is our way of sharpening research capacity of helping young people to write better, of getting uh, the quality of research and knowledge creation in the region uh, to be better than it has been before, and that will be taking place as well. Now, there is one couple of other things that we have in this conference. One of them uh, is what we call celebrating excellence. In the closing session of the plenary sessions, in, in the plenary session, in the closing session, we do have well, for these papers to be selected, we have reviewing committees and refereeing committees and so on and so forth. And they select the best paper out of each of these six themes. And we like to celebrate those who get the best papers award. And this is our way of recognizing excellence. This is our way of promoting good work. This is our way of really getting the young people to strive for doing, uh, for doing better. 
The last thing that we have that you don't want to miss is that we are having music, not only food for thought and not only good food, hopefully the guys at Marriott will do a good job. We are inviting you to a concert in the Mina House by the pyramids for the Arabic music. Uh, and the, it's going to be playing just for you. So don't miss out on that one. So this is in terms of my second point, which has to do with what else other than the main theme of the conference. Let me go to my th third and last point, uh, and this is, um, let me start off somewhere else. Um, at ERF, we have a fantastic way of governing that institution. We have a board of directors that is elected primarily by the, uh, the people, by the research fellows, who are really the people. And uh, they are changed every five years. Uh, the donors are typically non-voting on the board. So it is really a democratic institution. We also have term limits on managing directors. Two term limits. I remember a story or a, an article by a journalist in Lebanon called Rami Khori. He wrote a paper called, that, that was already something like seven, eight, ten years ago. 25 years term limits on presidents in the, in the Arab countries. He was proposing 25 ter years term limits. And he starts off the, the, the article by saying, well, don't laugh, because think about how many people are going to get rid of. And it turned out, <laughs> at the time, there was some like seven. I don't want to name them now, because some of them are gone already. But I, at ERF, we have term limits, and we respect term limits. We have two terms, and you're out. Not three strikes and you're out like in California. <laughs> it's two terms and you're out. And I would be at the end of 2016 have been at ERF for two terms. And respecting the rules, not bending them and not changing the constitution to continue, I would be stepping down. Now, thinking back, I have to say a few things about ERF. Uh, I was there, first of all, in 93 when it was, created first, was first created. And then, I was, so, and then I was a research fellow, and then I was elected to the board of ERF, and then I was selected to be the managing director of ERF, and now I'm going to be out of ERF, so I can say whatever I please, right? ERF is a fantastic institution. I want to say three things. One, it has come a long way. Uh, second, it is here to stay. And three, it can do even better. So let me say a few things about each. Uh, ERF has come a long way. It is absolutely remarkable, and I give Heba Handusa the credit for creating that community. The first 10 years was Heba Handusa's term. And somehow, with the magic magnetic personality of hers, she was able to glue or put together a community that became more like a family and more like friends. I think what everybody else after them, including myself, have tried to do is to maintain that. We have a community that I think is the best community of researchers on economic issues in the region, undoubtedly. In fact, I also know other communities, like in Latin America and elsewhere. They are not as closely related. Everybody is a friend with everybody. Sure, they fight, but that's if they don't, they're dead. So it's perfectly all right. But by and large, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic group of uh, people. Uh, pe they are very careful on selecting who else to join. And they are very careful. However, our activities are open to affiliates and non-affiliates. So even though we have a membership sort of thing, or uh, an affiliation, if you like, but our activities are open to anyone who qualifies. If we have a call for papers, anyone can apply, irrespective of whether they are. They are judged just like everybody else. So in any case, so we have a fantastic community of researchers. I think they are the most promising and the most uh, prominent. Uh, in the region on economic issues. We have a fantastic track record of publications. We have close to 1,000 working papers, not quite there yet, but exa uh, clo very close, uh, on many issues. Just name it and go and Google on the ERF website. You will find a wealth of, uh, of analysis and thoughtful ideas. And no one paper tells you what needs to be done. But collectively, they have a lot to offer you in terms of enriching your thinking, at least in a way of seeing the world, or multiple ways of seeing the world. We have our own international referee journal, which is something also that not many 
In economics, I don't know the other ones that, that have that kind of recog name recognition. And, uh, and it is, it's only five years old, so it's, it has a, a long way to go. But, but I think that was an important uh, achievement. Uh, that, is, that is more or less what, what I wanted to say on, on the track record. There, there is so much, you will see that in, your, in the annual report which you have in, in, in your binder. Uh, and you also can visit the website. But I want to say that ERF is also here to stay. It has proven, it has withstood the test of time. Uh, it has existed uh, since 93. Politics do change, but ERF does remain. We collaborate with a lot of other... I actually forgot to say something that I'm very proud of uh, previously, uh, which is the issue of microdata. ERF has done a fantastic job, thanks to the collaboration of people like General Jindi, uh, from CAPMAS, or the head of CAPMAS, president of CAPMAS, and other heads of statistical institutions in the region, we believe that microdata is a public good. We know that once you create the data, researchers are like bees, right? If you have flowers, they will come to you. You create microdata, they come and they use the data to produce wonderful things that you never even planned for them to do. So creation and supporting microdata is a fantastic thing to do, and I think we have done uh, a wonderful job, and we make the data available for free to any researcher who is doing serious work. Uh, my second point had to do with ERF is here to stay. I think, I think it has all the ingredients of continuing. We have an endowment now in the neighborhood of $18.5 million. We have our own villa uh, premise in, in Do'i, we have a fantastic uh, group of researchers and a research community. We have a very good track record. Uh, we have a fantastic group of donors, small donors, but very committed ones. They don't go away. I mean, we have the Arab Fund for Economic and Social Development. We thank him, uh, Dr. Abu Latif al-Hamad. We have the World Bank, and we actually have very good representation today from the World Bank. Uh, Hafez Ghanem, the Vice President of the MENA region in the bank, and uh, Assad. Uh, who is the re regional director of the World Bank here in, uh, located in Cairo. Um, and IDRC, that's the Canadian International Development Research Center. Uh, Bruce is not around, but he is going to be with us. Um, and the Swiss government. So we have a diversity, regional and non-regional uh, group of supporters. And I think what's wonderful about them is that they buy into what ERF does and they, they, they continue supporting the institution. And the, the most important thing for institutions of this kind, to be independent, to be able to do its own independent agenda, to, uh, to pursue research on the merit of it, to serve the public interest without being pushed around to serve somebody's interest, is that kind of multi-year thematic support, rather, or core support. So without that kind of support, honestly, we would not be here. So I want to thank them very much indeed uh, for their continued support to ERF. Now, ERF can do better. To search for a new managing director, uh, the board uh, put together a search committee. We advertised the job very widely. Uh, lots of people were interested. The search committee shorted, shortened the list. They had interviews and the short list is going to be interviewed by the board tomorrow. So hopefully before we leave uh, the Marriott to go someplace else, we would have a new managing director uh, designated. I would like that person to be there a few times to overlap with me so that we make sure there is a peaceful transition. Uh, peaceful transition, is that what I meant? I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, transitions are really wonderful things to have. As in, in places where you don't have transitions that easily. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I want to thank you for your attention. Sorry I have taken a little longer this time. I usually take shorter time than this one, but I allowed myself uh, to indulge a little bit. So thank you for your attention and enjoy the conference. <laughs>